Our opening words this morning are by Mel Hoover and Rose Eddington. All water is one. Water unites us. All water is one water, shape-shifting as it goes on and on in its unending cycle. The stream we gather by unites us with all the waters of the world, for all life depends on water. That's why this common, everyday element on which our very lives depend is sacred. In our thankfulness for water, let us remember to honor, cherish, and care for it, for our own lives, for all life touched by water, and for those who come after us. And with that, I would like to invite Peter forward to share with us some of his experiences um, with resilience and the environment. Well, first, I have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been a long time since I've been um, in a house of worship, uh, any, any house of worship. And I don't know whether it's a complete coincidence that this, like, like the river, it was uh, set up just because you knew I was coming here. Or the complete, all I know is that uh, whatever I was planning to say, I completely lost it. I'm feeling like I'm an emotional basket case right now. So <laughs> please forgive me. I mean, the testimonies, the songs, this takes me all back to my time with Krista, uh, traveling with up with people. If you want to know exactly, it was like 38 years ago. So imagine that. <clears throat> young Krista and young me. But uh, um, yeah, it's just it's just an amazing feeling to to be here. I've uh, this is a first for me uh, addressing the church audience. Actually, at a church service, I've given talks in churches, more about my book, and it's more of a, a longer lecture, so I'm, I'm um, somewhat shaking in, in my boots uh, right now, so I hope that um, what I have to say will, um, will resonate. <clears throat> you know, and when, when Krista sent me you know, the invitation, she said, oh, you know, talk about, you know, think of things about the theme of resiliency, and it can be from, from your own life, it can be from your current project, you know, which is this, this book, Hailing the Big River, Salmon Dreams and the Columbia River Treaty, which is a 13-year uh, volunteer odyssey labor of love that I've been working on. And I thought to myself, gosh, how do I narrow this down to like, you know, 15 minutes worth of, 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 of stuff? But when I, I think of the word resiliency, you know, and to me that means the ability to, to bounce back from difficult times, from, from challenges, whether it's things in your personal life, uh, personal traumas, whether it's uh, salmon or a river recovering from years of, of, of being damned and uh, being being mistreated. But I think along with the word resiliency, there's so many other words that come into my head, like being resourceful and your imagination and toughness and determination and imagination. I think these are all cousins and relatives of this theme of resiliency. Um, and I'd love to have the first picture shown up there. So, all that I've learned about resiliency in, in my life stems from this um, great woman here. This is my mother, uh, Ethel Pohutsky, and that's little me when I was like five-ish years old. I still remember that Jack. It's got like the, the, the American League and the, the National League uh, baseball teams on that. But, um, my mother was an amazing person. Uh, she passed away 10, 10 years ago, but she is the epitome of resilience, and she passed that on to me, and she also encouraged me um, to dream big and to, and to follow my heart. She used to say, you know, do what you love, the money will follow, you know, don't worry about things. And um, I was telling Krista this morning that I would call her, you know, at, at times, and I um, was living in Oregon and she was in Maine, and I'd, I'd whine and complain about this insomnia stuff I've been having for decades. And she goes, oh, shut up, you can sleep when you're dead, you know? <laughs> you know? It's like, you know it's always... it, was, it was her way of saying she loved me, right? But, um, but she's one of the most resilient uh, people uh, I know. I mean, she, I'm, I'm one of eight, and I'm the only one to follow in her uh, artistic uh, footsteps. She lived a very long life, living month to month, week to week, never knowing where the paycheck was going to come from. She was a, a brilliant writer and uh, author and children's book writer and uh, essayist. 
Um, so for, for better or worse, I followed in her footsteps. And she told me, she goes, you know, the rest, the rest of them, the kids, they're all normal, you're not. And, but again, she meant that in a good way. She goes, no, you have something else, else that to contribute to the world. And just never forget that. So I always um, admired that about her. And she had to make some tough decisions um, in early into her, her marriage. She realized that she probably had made a mistake. But, you know, seven or eight children later, um, she finally got up the courage to um, leave my father. And this was in the late 60s, early 70s, I was you know, raised Catholic, and at that time, that was a big no-no to, to have a, a woman divorce a man. But you know it was bad when the uh, parish priest told, told her and encouraged her uh, to leave. But still, that took a lot of courage and a lot of guts to do that. And you know, she had you know, seven kids uh, on the, under, under the roof. But where does that come from? Where does that strength, where does that re resilience? I mean, we, she gave herself her own nickname. She called herself the Polish Snowplow. Which means you just, you just put your head down and you go forward no matter what and don't let any naysayers, you know, um, distract you from what you think you're, you're really supposed to be doing. So I always, um, I'm so grateful uh, to her and she is the one who introduced me to nature and she would take me for walks in the woods and um, introduce me to plants and trees and, you know, there was this place called, we would call the Big Forest and the Little Forest. This was taken in upstate New York when I lived there as a child. And so to wander into that forest, you know, I'd hold her hand and it was it was magical time, and I'll, I I still forget that. But it's all because of her that I still retain the childlike awe of nature and um, the resilience that I find always comes from nature. That's my main source of my church and my spirituality these days. But um, again, I'm blown away by the choir. You guys just I'm just I'm still shaking in my boots. It's so so beautiful. So thank you. Um, please go ahead with the next picture. Um, so I know it's a little hard uh, to see here, but you can see right here, this is the Columbia River. And I'm standing at 11,200 feet. This is on the summit of Mount Hood in Oregon. This is in my, my backyard. But one of the reasons I'm showing you this image uh, along this theme of resilience, um, in June, uh, gosh, it was the solstice uh, of June in 2001, uh, I underwent complete the unexpected uh, triple bypass open heart surgery. And it came as a, quite a shock to me because I'm a mountain climber and backpacker and there was no, no signs of anything uh, happening in my life. But fast forward after the surgery, I lived along the Columbia River. And to heal, I went and sat by the shores of, of the Columbia River, and in particular, the place called Viento State Park. And just listening to the sounds of the water lapping up, even though the river down there is this big slack water lake, it just felt good and it made me calm made me safe. And as I got stronger, I started to hike up the trails in the Columbia River Gorge. And as, as Krista knows, the Columbia River Gorge is like a 3,000 foot wall and the trails aren't flat, they just go straight up. So I, I got stronger and stronger. And finally, about eight months later, when I was able to stand on the summit of Mount Hood, I knew that I, w I was healed, I was back. I remember the surgeon saying, oh, don't worry, you know, month after the surgery, you'll be able to go back to work. And I'm like, I don't think you understand. This is, this is my office. This is, this is my church. This is my spirituality. So, I mean, I got up there and I just wept like a baby. It just was un, un, unbelievable. But at that moment, there was, I had it all to myself. And I just spoke out loud to the universe. I just said, thank you so much. Someday I'm going to do something to honor the, the river for the healing that it gave me and to give back. Uh, to the river. I mean, it took took 13 years, but th this is the the buy the the, the, end, the end product of, of all that dreaming. Um, yeah, go ahead. So for this particular project, this this book, just a real brief 30 second synopsis. This is a photo essay about the entire Columbia River, from where it's born in the Rocky Mountains from British Columbia, and this is where it bubbles up from an underground spring um, all the way to the ocean. But it wasn't. It was never going to be just a book that's a, a pretty coffee table book. This project, I invited um, tremendous people from First Nations in Canada, tribal leaders in the United States, and others who are all advocating for the return of salmon on the Columbia River to go all the way back up in, into Canada. Because it, was, it was, once was one of the greatest salmon runs in the world until the Grand Coulee Dam uh, went in in uh, 1942. Um, so but the ability to stand up there and, and, and witness this, this magic. I mean, the nearby Kootenai River comes really close to it and is fed this underground, underground spring. But I, I knelt there 
and I just scooped up the water and, and, and drank from it. And you know, when you're talking about the river, a free flowing river, wild and free, to see what it looks like up there and to see it moving down here, I know it's maybe hard to see, but this is what the river looks like up there for nearly 200 miles. It's maybe 15 yards across and it runs wild and free. And you can kayak the whole thing. And I've spent, uh, I can't tell you how many trips I've made from Hood River all the way up there, like nice little 16 hour drive. But once you get up there, you feel like you're, you're in heaven. It's all kind of like going home. Because if you love rivers and you want to be near something that's wild and free, I highly recommend you add it to, not necessarily a bucket list, but if you're interested in the Columbia and want to learn more about it, go up there and you'll fall in love with it um, all, all over again. Um, but, you know, again, the theme of resilience, um, I learned from my mother to, you know, never give up, right? So this, this one image, this self-portrait of myself, took almost three days uh, to complete. Because I went up there, I found the headwaters, but it was terrible weather, just British Columbia, December, minus 13 degrees, terrible, terrible. But it finally cleared j just, just for a little bit, but there was nobody there but me. So I'm thinking to myself, well, how do I capture this moment? How do I share this with the world? So I just did, you know, old school photography, put the camera on a tripod and ran up there, you know, did this thing. You know, came back, looked at it, and I'm like, well, that's terrible, do it again. So I was like, was, how do you know where to put your head? How do you guess where the sun is? I mean, so this was just, you know, the universe finally came through and gave me something that was uh, salvageable. But, you know, again, this is an example of like, throughout the course of this project in my life, the last 13 years, the notion of, of never giving up, because I didn't know how I was going to bring this book to fruition. I just knew that I, that I had to do it. Um, on my computer uh, at home, I have this, this quote from Aristotle that uh, inspires me. Um, I'm trying to remember it now because I'm just shaking like a leaf with emotion still from the music. That just, but it says, you know, where, where the needs of the world and your talents intersect, therein lies your purpose. When I came across that quote about a decade ago, I'm like, okay, you know, that's it. You know, from this, this point forward, as Krista had uh, alluded, for most of my career, I'd been just a, a fine art photographer and I was happy to do books and calendars, but um, there was a, a thing that happened uh, in, in my life that I'll get to in, in the last picture that sort of changed the, the, the direction. Um, so please go ahead. So as part of this uh, project, I wanted to interview and photograph as many uh, First Nations and tribal people as possible to get their perspective on, on, on the loss of salmon to their culture and their hopes for the future. And this is a gentleman named Alfred Joseph. He is the chief of the Akisquinic First Nation tribe up near Lake Windermere along the Wild and Free section in British Columbia. And I sat down with him and he was telling me the story of how his grandfather went down to the shores of the river near the headwaters, I think in the summer of 1940, 1941, to greet the annual return of fish, and these were the salmon that they referred to as June hogs, which are like this massive, like 80 pound fish that would come all, all the way up. And his grandfather went down, you know, a week went by, you know, there's no fish, you know, a couple more weeks, a couple of months, there's no fish. And they didn't understand, you know, what was happening. You know, they had said, well, surely we must have done something to alienate the creator for the fish not to come here. Well, they had no idea, you know, this is way before the era of cell phones and text, that Grand Coulee Dam had been completed enough so it blocked the passage. And, you know, he said, you know, it stopped our, our way of life, our culture, our identity, our, our spirituality, our, our economic survival. It just, just wasn't fair. And he's telling me this story and I can see like a single tear, you know, in his eye and my chest, just like I'm, I am now, I'm shaking, just welling up with emotion. I'm like, come on, Peter, keep your stuff together. Don't lose it in front of this gentleman. But he just, he just stared off in the distance and he said, we're still waiting. So, you know, this is one of the dozens of stories of their faith and their resiliency to hang in there and to be determined to, regardless of what happens, you know, with this Columbia River Treaty renegotiations between the U.S. and Canada, whatever the result is, my feeling in talking to the tribes and First Nations is that they're going to go forward with some sort of plan. They're just tired of waiting for dominant culture scientists and politicians to do the right thing. So. Please, go ahead. So this was another one of those amazing moments. This is a, a fisherman from the Colville tribe. His name is Randy Friedlander. And we're standing near the base of the Grand Coulee Dam. 
And he has this tradition that was passed on to him from his grandfather, where when the first uh, runs of salmon come up in the spring and early summer, up below uh, Chief Joseph Dam, about 30 miles downstream, he harvests the fish, cleans them, guts them, and he comes to the base of the Grand Coulee Dam, and he says a prayer that loosely translates that he thanks his grandfather for teaching him uh, how to catch fish and this um, idea of returning fish to the river. But he also was doing this to apologize to the creator for what happened to the salmon. You know, they feel very um, badly that the salmon were, have been blocked to come, come back to their homes. So by placing the remains of the salmon in the river, is his thought and their prayer that when the salmon do come back again, their spiritual DNA of their ancestors will be there as sort of a way marker to show them the way. And when we're talking about resiliency, I mean, I mean, you folks know this just living up here and being aware of issues in the Snake River. I mean, salmon have to be one of the most re resilient creatures on, on the planet. I mean, everything is thrown at them to, to drive them to extinction, but they're, they're tenacious, they're, they're fierce. But, you know, who speaks for, for the salmon? And, that, and, that, and that's the issue. I mean, salmon, it's not like, you know, when you go online and you can see the, the panda bears at the Washington Zoo and these cute little warm and fuzzy things when they're born, everyone gets excited. Salmon are sort of out of sight, out of mind. So it takes a lot of people, a lot of efforts, like when I gave a talk yesterday for the Sierra Club, all the good work they're doing. Um, and it takes people like myself who have a, a platform as, as an artist, and I can get away with saying stuff that politicians and other people are too scared to, to say. You know, I can say things like, this is morally reprehensible, you know, where a politician will not go there, you know? So it's, um, uh, anyways, a real uh, honor and a privilege to have been able to witness um, some of these things. Uh, peace, go ahead. So, when I was giving my, my talk last night, I'm uh, talking about salmon. This is a, a sockeye salmon on the Okanagan River, way up in, in British Columbia. And for this book project, I was desperate to get a good uh, image of uh, of salmon. And I went up there and the tribal leader said, oh, well, there's hundreds of thousands that are coming up during this two-week period. You know, don't worry, you'll get an amazing shot of tons of fish. So I get up there, I insert myself in the water, my neoprene suit on, waited for hours, and the fish would come at me and I could see them, but then like from 20 feet away, they went like this. <laughs> around me. And I'm like, okay, just, just, just remain calm. It's, it's going to work out. So on the third day, I'm getting ready to leave. And I'm super frustrated. I'm like, okay, God, you've led me all the way up here. Please don't let, send me home empty-handed. So I'm just about ready to pack up, and suddenly this one fish breaks away and comes over, and he just does this for like a few seconds and goes away. But it was almost like you know the creator of the universe was saying, look, this guy is trying to help you out. Like, Throw him a bone, you know, to go over. So I was like, oh my God, fish. I just got in the wonder real quick and, and got, got one, one picture. But even, even this, I mean, they go, this is from the ocean up, this is about a 900 mile journey. They come up to Columbia, then they go up the Okanagan River. And I have to say, some of the, the best tasting salmon I've, I've ever had, the o Okanagan salmon this is truly uh, tremendous. But there, that run almost went to extinction about um, 25, 30 years ago. But through um, work with the uh, tribal uh, fisheries up there, the Okanagan Nation, working with other um, uh, organization that they were able to revive the run and now it's just in the hundreds of thousands. It's quite quite something to see. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, please go ahead. So, sorry. When Krista made the point about me shifting to from landscapes to doing work that was for the greater good, so to speak. Um, part of this stemmed from um, a wonderful miracle that happened to me uh, seven years ago. I was invited to serve as a volunteer still photographer for a documentary film about an amazing uh, gentleman named Jagat Lama in the foothills of uh, the Himalayas. He was a, uh, is a, uh, a trekking guide, but he dedicated his whole life to trying to lift his village of Kumari uh, out of poverty and on a path to self-sustainable way of living. And I was so touched and so moved by that experience, uh, I said to myself, I, I want to stay connected to this village. Well, that was 2013. <clears throat> so you may remember in April of 2015, <clears throat> there was a massive earthquake in, in Nepal. Very, very tragic, like 8.0. The epicenter was very near this village. So I was, I was heartbroken. So in my little town of Hood River, it's amazing, and I'm sure you guys have had experiences how things can happen like that. 
in about a 36 hour period, I raised $25,000. And it, the bulk of it happened because I went down to this coffee shop and I sat there because the, the local newspaper had said, you know, the coffee shops are going to donate, you know, a percentage of their sales. So I sat there all day with an you know, empty oatmeal canister with a sign on it, you know, make a donation. And I would just sit there and I would guilt people into making you know, <laughs> donations. <clears throat> and this one gentleman came by and he said, well, tell me more, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, I, I serve on a foundation, you know, would, would $25,000, you know, be of any use? And I just about, you know, <laughs> collapse. So, <clears throat> but the, uh, what's the word? In order to get this donation, they wanted proof that the money was being sent, spent exactly on what it was. Because there's a lot of stuff in um, uh, when tragedies happen worldwide where there's corruption. And Nepal is one of the worst places. If you give it to the government, who knows where it'll end up. So long story short, I got on the plane and during the middle of monsoon season in late June, early July, flew to Nepal, went out and documented the purchase of the tin and, and the building materials and all that. While I was there, this gentleman, Jagat, says, you know, I'm getting old and I'm getting really tired. And keep this in mind, he's 44 years old. Right? But over there, there, there's this sort of you know, understanding that if you, don't, if you haven't made it by the time you're in your mid-40s, you're, you're just a loser, you're, you're washed up. And he says, but you know, there's a new generation of people and I want you to meet this, the, the, this young woman. I think she has the potential to become a great leader for our community. So he introduces me to her, her name is uh, Sumitra uh, Gurung, and he says, well, interview her. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm not a journalist, I don't know what to say. He says, oh, you know, I'm sure you'll think of something. So I'm standing there and she's looking at me because she doesn't speak any English, so I just, I asked her, you know, one question. I said, you know, what is your dream? And Jagat translated that to her, and she's looking at me, and all of a sudden, I mean, just tears are just pouring out of her face. And I thought, oh God, what have I done? What have I said? To I did something probably culturally inappropriate, whatever. And he turns to me and he says, no. He says, no one has ever asked her that question. And I was just astounded. But I, later on, I, was, I learned that you know, she's from a large family. And women in Nepal and some other uh, countries like that are not expected to aspire to anything else other than being a wife, a cook, the person who goes out and cuts the wood and cuts the grass. I mean, trust me, when I was over there, a lot of the men just sit around smoking cigarettes. It's the women who do all, all the work. Um, so I was, just, I, I was just overwhelmed with this woman's uh, response. And I was only there to get this for three days. It was just an insane trip because it was the only amount of time I had. But on the ride home, I said to myself, There's, I have to do something, I have to do something. So again, long story short, in the time we have today, I approached my local rotary because I knew they gave scholarships to high school students, and I said, would you consider something on an international basis? Lo and behold, they loved what I had to, do, um, to say, and um, they gave her a full college scholarship to go to school in, in Kathmandu, and she's in her, I think, her, her third or fourth year um, right, right now. And last fall, I went over to do a trek uh, with this company, because I, I always go, um, if not every year, every other year, to try to um, help promote his company, help promote what he's doing. In his latest venture, he's uh, created a women's coffee cooperative, so all these families are now joining so they can grow uh, the coffee and they become self-sustainable, and I'm helping him in a variety of ways. But this young woman, this photo, she, she was invited by Jacket to go on a trek in the Himalayas. She has never left her village other than to go into Kathmandu to go to class, so she's never even seen the Himalayas. See, a lot of us may think that, oh, people who live in Nepal, of course they all go into the, the Himalayas. Well, they don't. They stay home and, and they work. But to hike with her and to see the joy on her face and the quiet strength and her resilience, her, her determination to become a leader. And she's, her English is getting a little bit better because I told her, I said, my dream is for when you learn enough English, we want to get you, fly you to America, fly you to Hood River, and stand before this rotary that gave you the scholarship and just tell your story and say thank you. you know, so she's, she's working on it. We, we messenger each other and she refers to me as respected godfather Peter Sir. <laughs> um, I mean, but you know, I've seen her in action. She's just, she's just a fierce woman, a fierce warrior, a great leader. You know, they were um, rebuilding her family's home and she was frustrated with the way the men were working so she just pushed them out of the way and she starts shoveling and putting the poles in the ground. It's like she just has no tolerance for you know, um, inefficiency. <laughs> Which again reminds me of my mother. She was very much the, the same way. 
but um, I was just, just thrilled with that experience. Again, when I came back and I got her the scholarship, it got me to thinking like, you know, I've had a really nice life as a landscape photographer, but that's not what I want to leave behind. So, you know, what is, it, what is it that I can do? So that's what led me uh, to doing this project. You know, when I found out about the Columbia River Treaty and how uh, tribes and First Nations were left out of the negotiations, you know, 50 some years ago, and now that it's being renegotiated, the, the same thing is happening again, which is just unconscionable and, uh, and immoral. So I'm trying to go around as I give talks and lectures and remind people that, hey, you know, this, did you know about this treaty? Did you know that, the, you know, where the Columbia River begins? Did you know what has happened? And, sh and by sharing these stories, I hope to get people inspired to talk to their mayors, their congressmen, their state senators, and to send a message up to our State Department who's leading these negotiations to say, hey, you know, what's the problem here? Why don't you guys involve the tribes in negotiations? This is their river. This is the, the first peoples, you know, the, all the dams that went in. It's, to me, it's a, it's a kind of an, an illegal taking. I mean, I know we all benefit from the hydropower and the cheap electricity and all that, but there is a certain things that uh, have happened and there, it needs to be redressed and the rights of the wrong, uh, the rights, the wrongs of the past need to, need to be righted. And so with this, with this book, I, I'm hoping to, to do that. Um, if I have time, I just want to read one, one brief thing. And it was wonderful that uh, Krista read uh, that Chinook prayer, because that, 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 that's in the book. And I was actually there when Maya Lin was dedicating this um, um, place way back in 2006. So that's how long I've been working on this project. Um, so the, the picture uh, that I showed you of my, of my mother, uh, there was an incident that happened um, last summer as I was working on this project. And I'll just read this, and then I'll, I'll be on my way. But it's really hard to keep this too short. This, there's so many things I could talk about. Um, this is called Reaching for Home. And this, I'll show you this picture, which is not here. Right here is a picture of a tribal person holding on to a salmon, and they're placing it into the water above Grand Coulee Dam for the first time in over 80 years. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers allows the tribes to do what's called a cultural release. And the tribes are taking advantage of these releases to track these fish and to prove to the Corps of Engineers and the, and the, and the other doubting uh, US scientists that the fish will know how to, how to find their, their way home. <clears throat> on August 16, 2019, Salmon swam upstream above Grand Coulee Dam for, for reaching for home for the first time in over 80 years. Invited by the Colville tribes, it was a thrill to bear witness to this symbolic cultural release of 30 salmon back into the waters above the dam. I have been privileged to experience many special moments during my years of working on this book, but this by far had the biggest impact on my heart and soul. It was many things, a celebration, a reunion of family and friends, and a coming together of First Nations and tribes who traveled great distances to participate in this historic event. When the truck arrived carrying salmon recently caught downstream below Chief Joseph Dam, emotions poured out, tears flowed, and primal screams of joy echoed across the water. A line was formed to carefully pass each salmon to the water's edge. Children gathered on the shore to touch the backs of the salmon, held gently by a tribal elder before releasing them to freedom. I stood calf deep in the water, composing from a respectful distance, but close enough to feel the electric wonder of a salmon brush against my leg before darting upstream, like its ancestors since the beginning of river time. In this very moment of tribal unity, of celebrating the possible and honoring ancestors, I felt compelled to honor my own tribe. When my mother, Ethel Pohotsky, passed in 2010, she was the last of her clan from Poland. And so I honor her now from this moment forward to be known as Peter Pohotsky Marbach. In 2001, the life-giving rivers of arteries in me became blocked. If not for emergency bypass surgery, my extinction was certain. Salmon need a bypass system at key dams that will ensure not only the survival of the species, but to revitalize the culture, the spirituality, and economic vitality of the people of the river. The Columbia River Treaty negotiations underway 
provides a once in a generation opportunity to modernize an agreement that respects and honors indigenous knowledge and opens the door to revitalizing what was once one of the greatest migrations of salmon on the planet. Salmon have proved they are tenacious survivors, resilient for sure. Through the chapters of our lives, we are all swimming upstream, seeking safe passage as we reach our way toward home. <laughs>